Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his short work, Notes from Underground, Fyodor Dostoevsky draws a contrast between two fundamentally different kinds of people who live in the same world, but who experience it quite differently and react to it and think about it in very different ways. And the contrast here is between the narrator who portrays himself as an intellectual, and in particular, an intellectual of the 19th century, and we'll talk about whether or not that applies to later centuries as well. The contrast is between the intellectual and what he calls at various points the ordinary person or the man or person of action or the, the man of character, the person who has some sort of fixed comportment, you could say, a set of values that they follow, a set of commitments. They know where they stand in the world. They may in fact be go, going down and dying in some blaze of glory or in some miserable foxhole, but at least they know where they are. They may be trying to gamble and, and, and win big and they may in fact lose or they may uh, attempt to marry well or fight a duel, but in any case, they're doing something. And this would apply to not just people in the nobility, but all the way down to the peasant. At one point, Dostoevsky's character talks about this person as recognizing where the walls are and looking at them quite stolidly and, and not trying to you know, keep bashing themselves against it because the wall has a sort of soporific effect. But where there's an open vista, well, they act. They do things. They exert themselves. The intellectual is very different from this. And Dostoevsky is going to call this sort of person by a lot of different names. They are reflective. They think about things. Reflective not just in the sense of paying attention, but thinking things over, mulling them over, ruminating upon them. Uh, they're intelligent. They can, they can see further. They can draw inferences and understand assumptions that the other people can't. They have a, what he calls a heightened consciousness. That's a term that he uses at several points in, in this work. What does that mean to have a heightened consciousness? They are aware of more. They take in more than the ordinary person, the person of action or character does. And so when we get down to it, what are they aware of? Well, let's take a look at some of the characterizations in the text. Very early on, he talks about himself, this character. He says, I am a sick man. I'm a mean man. There's nothing attractive about me. And he goes on and he says, really, I don't understand anything about my sickness. I'm not even too sure what it is that's ailing me. I'm morbidly superstitious. You may say that I refuse medical help simply out of contrariness. I don't know about that, but I've been living like this a long time. He's somebody who, in a certain respect, recognizes how crazy and contingent this world is. And yet at the same time, it is a world in which there are good things, valuable things. And he understands how difficult it is to, to have them, how contingent those are and how much he fails to measure up to them. He doesn't think highly of himself. 
And he goes on, he talks a little bit about the job that he, that he used to have and his conflicts. And then he, he goes on and he, he says that um, for everyday needs, the average person's awareness is more than sufficient. Now, the intellectual is suffering from not a deficit, but a surplus. A surplus is something that is at the same time negative. He says, too great lucidity is a disease, a true full-fledged disease. Why? He says, it's about a half or quarter the, the average person's awareness of the unhappy 19th century intellectual, particularly if he's unfortunate enough to live in Petersburg, the most abstract and premeditated city on earth. There are premeditated and unpremeditated uh, cities. Now, what he's saying here could apply just as well to our own time, particularly in this, this hyper-connected uh, time of the internet where if somebody wants to be an intellectual, they have an access to uh, information coming from all different sources that would be almost unimaginable even in Dostoevsky's time. What the intellectual is, is experiencing is a sort of rootlessness, a sort of ungroundedness. And we're going to explore some other important aspects, but let's see what else he says. He says, the extent of consciousness at the disposal of what may be termed the spontaneous people and men of action is quite sufficient. I'm not going to take a crack at them. What happens when you are hyper-conscious? Well, you grasp how much you fail to measure up. If you're not, you know, that intelligent, you might actually think that you're a decent person. You might actually think that you measure up to the true, the good, the beautiful, these ideals that we place out there. You might even think that you fit into the ideal of the group or the religion or political association or pick whatever else it is, the bowling league. You might even think that you're, you know, something that you're not with respect to something as seemingly trivial as that. You might think that you're great at your job. You might think that you're okay at your job and that's, that's quite good enough because you don't need to measure yourself against anyone else. You might buy into all sorts of new agey, self-helpy things as well. If you're not all that bright, Dostoevsky is saying, that's enough. It'll work for you and you're not going to be bothered by a lot of qualms. You find your, as we say, you find your bliss and you stick with it, right? So he goes on, um, this is in section three, and when he's talking about, you know, getting angry and taking revenge and all those sorts of things, he says that ordinary people are able to handle that. The normal person um, gets angry and they think that they're, you know, just in doing that. But the intellectual is more like a mouse. He calls him a test tube product rather than a child of nature. He says that he's so subdued by his antithesis that he views himself, heightened consciousness and all, as a mouse rather than as a man. Even if he's a mouse with a heightened consciousness, he's still nothing but a mouse, whereas the, the other is a man. And why is he being humiliated over and over again? Because any sort of course of action that he looks at seems insufficient seems contingent. It might work. It might not work. Why should he try it? Even if he does succeed, it's not really going to produce the results that he's looking for. He's smart enough to know that. This can apply just as well to the romantic life, right? Uh, should I ask this person out? Should I go dance with them? Very popular thing back then. Should I introduce myself? Should I put myself out there? Should I take a chance? Well, if I do, who knows what that's going to lead to? Well, actually, I can project what it's going to lead to. I can think of 50 different possibilities, and any one of them could be what happens, and none of them are truly going to make me happy. Because even the happily ever after, well, I know that that's really a pipe dream. I'm realistic about these sorts of things. Whereas the ordinary person is quite romantic and can go off and do that. Same thing with the workplace. Should I take this kind of job? Should I take this kind of job? 
The person who's the intellectual knows that all the jobs suck in one way or another. So they understand the contingency, the falseness of any action that they might take. And this produces something like a paralysis. An inertia is how Dostoevsky puts it. The net result of this is that the intellectual, as he says, is unable to truly be anything. He is not able to make him or herself into something that they can actually call by something. He says, I couldn't manage to make myself nasty, nor for that matter, friendly, crooked or honest, a hero or an insect. I can't make myself into anything. I'm trying to live my life in a corner, consoling myself with a stupid, useless excuse that an intelligent man cannot turn himself into anything. Only a fool can make anything he wants out of himself. And he feels that he's spineless because of this. He can't make himself into anything that he can strictly identify with or commit to Why? In part because he realizes there's so many other possibilities. And he also realizes that anything that he does, he's sort of playing at. He's not totally committed to it. He could have done differently. He still can do differently. Although Dostoevsky is not using this term at this point, the intellectual is conscious of a freedom that the ordinary person is not conscious of. So they're unable to be anything. There's another passage later on, quite quite funny, where he talks about laziness. And he says, if only my doing nothing were due to laziness, how I'd respect myself then. Why, why would you respect yourself as somebody who is lazy? He says, well, I would know that I could be lazy at least, that I have at least one definite feature in me, something positive, something to be sure of. People could ask, Who is he? And the response could be a lazy man. And he would know who he really is. The intellectual, unlike everybody else, doesn't really know who they are. And that plagues him. It introduces, as he says, a strange state that is a sort of inertia. He talks in another passage about how uh, the ordinary person um, you know, is able to do things because they're not plagued by all these questions and doubts. And um, another way he puts this is they don't see the difference between primary and secondary causes. Right? And, but the intellectual person, unfortunately, does. So they see how things work and they realize that acting, for example, in terms of revenge or romance or the workplace or prestige among friends or whatever it happens to be, a noble gesture, never really fulfills the promise that it seems to make. So... That's a problem. This introduces a kind of incapacity to act. If you know that nothing really means anything, then why not succumb to inertia? His laziness is not, or his inertia is not actually laziness, he says. Um, A little bit later on, he brings up this inertia again at at the very end. And he says, it's best to do nothing at all. Conscious inertia is the best. A toast to my hole under the floor. And though it was said that I was green with envy of the normal man, I still wouldn't take his place under present circumstances, though I'll go on envying him. And he's, he's justifying the inertia that he succumbs to. There's... Two other features that we could say are characteristic of the intellectual as Dostoevsky is constructing him here reflectively in in the underground man. One is that the, the intellectual is able to take pleasures in things that we might consider perverse or morbid. Um, for example, he says that, well, you, you know, People can take pleasure in a toothache. Haven't you ever heard an intellectual suffering from a toothache, the groans that they make? Uh, And he also says that despair itself 
provides a certain kind of pleasure. The despair of realizing that the world is divided up into people who actually know what's going on, or at least think they know what's going on, and uh, can't do anything, and can't be anything. And then all the other fools out there who, uh, there's something a little bit admirable about, about, about them. They're able to do something. They're able to be something, even though it's really quite, you know, silly and they aren't what they think that they are. They don't have any idea what they're really doing. The world is divided up into these two classes and neither one of them is really fulfilled according to Dostoevsky. And the intellectual can't will him or herself into the other class even if they wanted to. So they take a kind of pleasure in that despair. The last thing is that he accuses himself by placing this in the mouth of the would-be reader of engaging in a kind of cowardice. But he's not even a coward. The cowardice of the intellectual is not the cowardice of the person who's chronically afraid. No, it's a different kind of cowardice. A cowardice that postures, a cowardice that comes out of the mouse hole every so often and stakes out a claim, but does so ironically, does so seemingly making a commitment, but not able to truly do so. And whenever it does make a commitment, it realizes that this is a purely contingent act and that it may totally backfire and doesn't mean anything anyway. So this is a pretty dismal picture of what the intellectual is like in late modernity. St. Petersburg is, you know, sort of an emblem of this, but we could think about any other city on earth. And I think with the internet that you're accessing this through right now, we could talk so much about this happening at any given place. So another way of talking about this is the intellectual is conscious of the absurdity of existence, particularly the existence of the intellectual, him or herself. 